Matthew chapter number 18, uh, the biblical text is uh, the uh, first gospel of uh, record of Jesus' life ministry that is at least uh, ordered in the New Testament, the Christian scriptures. Matthew is thought to have been uh, one of the biblical texts that was written with a Jewish audience in mind, Matthew written or attributed at least to the apostle Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. Matthew was someone who had lots of proximity to Jesus, literally spent a good chunk of his life uh, walking with Jesus, or at least a chunk of Jesus' ministry, those three years walking with Jesus, hanging out with Jesus. He recounted and uh, collected many of these stories, and they have emerged and uh, came from uh, uh, both a shared text that was called the Q source that Mark literally kind of helped to pull together as verbally kept alive through the oral traditions. And so you find this passage of scripture literally emerging out of the first, say, 30 years after Jesus uh, died on the cross. There were folks that were still struggling to keep the memory of Jesus' uh, words and teachings alive. They were waiting for Jesus to come back because they remember, man, Jesus, if he raised from the dead, you know, then Jesus can do anything. Amen. If I seen Jesus dead on Friday and he walking around on Sunday, that Jesus can do anything. Somebody say Amen. Amen. The resurrection changed everything for these eyewitnesses. And so uh, we find the gospel according to Matthew being a really interesting uh, recapitulation of Jesus' ministry and trying to capture it so people would be clear about what Jesus was asking of them. And more than anything, it's worth noting that throughout the text, the words of Scripture are constantly in their original Greek uh, or Aramaic, if you will, speaking with a collective we, not an individual I. And in Western societies, particularly Western Christian societies, we often translate or we interpret the word you, Y-O-U, individually. So when it says you ought to do this, we'd be like, oh, yes, I ought to do this. But it's important to appreciate that in the mind of the earliest followers of Jesus, when Jesus said you ought to do something, they understood Jesus is talking about we, right? That there is no faithful way to follow Jesus apart from the we, because there is an important consideration that as Dr. King powerfully states, we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. And what affects one person directly affects all of us indirectly. It is what I believe one of the most concise reinterpretations or rearticulation of Jesus underlying, or at least the gospel's underlying assumption which is to say that we must follow Jesus in order for we to be faithful. Amen. And there is room for the I inside the we. Hello, somebody. You can't get to the we without the I. So you'd be like, oh, man, where do I fit in there? You fit inside the we. I mean, literally, if you were to use the Nintendo spelling of the we, praise God, there's two eyes. There's two of you in there. Somebody say amen. Give your neighbor a high five. Tell there's two of us in here. Amen. There's, there, there's the me I don't like and the me I do like. They both fit inside the we. And so uh, this passage uh, was in the lectionary. I did not, you know, choose this passage to preach from. I feel like this passage chose me. Amen. You know, how you read a passage like, oh, I'm not going. I'm not going. I'm not going to preach from that passage. That's when you know you gotta. Do some exegesis and get on your knees and ask the Lord to help me. And this is what this passage is doing. I'm preaching to you so I can be helped. Matthew chapter number 18, verse number 15 says, if another member of the church sins against you, Lord, I can just stop right there. 
Because, you know, we define church. I just went on this long diatribe about the we. <laughs> but I don't want some of these folk in the church I'm a part of. Because when they sin against you, it says go out and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. So I got to deal with these people alone? And if the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. It's fascinating. Jesus is talking to his disciples about how to deal with conflict, how to have a thriving community of people who likely will not always agree. Fascinating. Verse number 17, if the member refuses to listen to the witnesses, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Whew. I don't think that was a compliment. <laughs> Amen. Jesus was, you know, I think trying to make a rhetorical point that the Gentile and the tax collector may not subscribe to the, the communal norms of this congregation. It's not to say that there's something morally inferior about a Gentile or a tax collector or all of us as Gentiles, except for the one or two few of you who have Jewish lineage. We all would be kind of like on the outside. Jesus is not giving a commentary about inclusivity. Jesus is giving a commentary about we all have norms that we agree to participate in when we are building community. So if they're not going to listen, then it's like, okay, well, if you're not going to listen, then we are now acknowledging that, hey, you no longer want to be a part of this normative, moral uh, community as it relates to how we resolve our differences. So then Jesus goes on, verse number 18, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything, you ask. Yes. Ooh, that is quite a, quite a, let me see. Is it, is it geometry or trigonometry where it talks about the if, the if, will con conditional statements I, you know I was up uh, I got I got woken up in the middle of the night trying to remember conditional statements and I just all I need to do is call Liz at around two in the morning and I, I could have went on back to sleep Jesus before we even named was giving us some conditional if you if you Two of you agree on earth about anything you ask. It will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk from the topic for the next few moments. Pull up Jesus. Pull up Jesus. I just... I just need you to pull up. God bless the word that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide your word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And as I stand and preach and teach your word, I pray that you will send an anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Come on, give your neighbor a high five and tell him, pull up, Jesus. I need Jesus to pull up. I'm going through some things, and I need the Lord to pull up. Uh, now, again, in the spirit of this particular pericope, it's important to ground much, if not all, we're going to say in the context of the important call from God for us to create healthy community and that within this particular passage we have all kinds of admonitions on how to do that 
and acknowledge that along the way there are some practices, there are some conceptual frameworks, there are even some expectations we can have when we lean into or live into community. That community building is hard to create. It's hard to commit to. Uh, because for many of us, we are more naturally inclined to be in communities of affinity. Which is just to say that I like to be in spaces where pretty much everybody agrees with me. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Especially when you are in communities throughout the week where nobody agrees with you. Or not enough people agree with you. You be ready to go to work in the morning, you just kicking, you know, you just kicking all the way to work. Oh, I got the, I got the, I, I, how many of y'all was just thankful for the, 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 the virtual work policy? <laughs> Amen. See, I could, I could, I could go to work and turn off my computer screen. I don't even got to look at you. Amen. It's, except for that, except for that, that, that mean thing, that, 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 that picture of you that always trying to catch you at your best. But that ain't how you look in person, amen. It's all different, so I just don't, going to, what, and going to work, and now we back in person, I got to come in three days a week. <laughs> and deal with you in person three days out the week. That's, that's many of our reality, amen. Like there's certain people that you do not enjoy being around throughout the week. And so the question is, how do we exist in a world and a context where we won't always appreciate the community we are at times required to participate in? I mean, one of the great reasons why we want to amplify the call for Back to Church Sunday for all of us is we think we got a pretty cool community, right? Like, like if you come to the way, you aren't going to be fussed at. You aren't going to be told how you on your way to hell. <laughs> I mean, if you on your way, you ain't going to like, you know, you, you, we're going to be trying to compel you without telling you. <laughs> Just turn around. This is... You know, There's another way. It's, it's hot over there. Come this way, right? We'll try to give you as many descriptions as to why you ought to not run into that burning house. Somebody say amen, right? You're going to get some information about how to love on your community through justice and mercy. You're going to find some folk who, you know, you may enjoy hanging out with. And you're going you're gonna to hear some good music. You're going to hear some preaching women. Ooh, these some preaching women. My God. I mean, that, that, you're going to meet some folk who are scholars, some people who are expert technicians, some folk who, who just, you know, on their way back from a hellish kind of life and condition, and, and you're going to be able to watch them emerge into God's best. All of that within one community. Who wouldn't want to be a part of the way? You ought to ask, you ought to ask, why, what's wrong with you? Why, why are you not here? Well, I mean, you know, you at your job, you hate your job, you hate your neighbor. Come on to the way. That's a great pitch for you to make for Back to Church Sunday, next Sunday. I just gave you the language. I gave you the reasons. <laughs> All right, Pastor Nisha, I did, I did my job. Back to Church Sunday. I, I gave them everything they needed to know. Can you be a contagious follower of Jesus while you are a member of the way. Can you invite people into this shared way of life? Why? Because people are looking for good community. And yet, even when you get good community, you may not always agree. You may have differences that can at times be so stark that they cause some tension. One of the Things that happened during the pandemic, according to uh, this theory, I maybe have used it a few times before, called third space theory, this idea that spaces of meaning and belonging were obliterated during the pandemic while we were all in 
isolation and lockdowns and we couldn't go to third spaces where we could find meaning and belonging outside the context of your family and your work. How many of you know sometimes we have family we did not choose and depending on the, every, you know, the day of the week, you in good relationship with those family members. And then other weeks, you're like, I wish I had another family. And then you have family you do choose, which is just to say that there are seasons in your life where you have people that nurture you and love on you. And it's like, you my brother from another mother. You ever said that before? Then you get into you know, relationships of intimacy, marriage, partnerships, uh, uh, father, f uh, mother, parental. You get all these different kind of relationships that you choose to be a part of. Well, I want to submit that there is a spiritual benefit to being a part of a faith community that can love you and I into relationship with God that is at its core communal and yet even when we do all of it right Jesus said guess what when you have a ought against your neighbor your brother your sister your sibling your church member you have to figure out how do you work through the conflict and what I love about this passage I'm gonna skip to the end just for a second is that the assumption Jesus gives to them is when that is happening, I want you to always know I'm a pull up. <laughs> so we got some challenges. We got some struggles. If you have the courage to lean into community in Jesus name, Jesus says, I will pull up. Now, it's a gift when Jesus pulls up. Like, you know, a lot of us be calling on Jesus to pull up when we're by ourselves. And I'm glad Jesus pulls up when I'm by myself. When I'm going through, you're like, oh, Jesus, I'll be calling out the Lord all the time. Especially don't get on my nerves. I'm not using Jesus' name in vain. I'm literally asking Jesus, pull up! Because if you don't, this is about to be some, some disobedient McBride behavior <laughs> up in this. <laughs> Anybody got them tendencies? Say, my spirit be willing. Oh, but this old flesh, all right? So Jesus does pull up whenever we call on the Lord. We have the expectation that the Lord will answer. And we see Jesus telling his disciples, you want to have a guarantee that I'm going to pull up? Get in community. Get in community when it's tough. Get in community when it's easy. Get in community when you agree. Get in community when you don't. Whew. Jesus, why you put this on paper? You know, there's some things I was just floated out in the air. Yeah, plausible deniability. But when you read the scripture all the way through, there's some things in there you'd be like, oh. <laughs> no, you didn't really mean this, did you? Well, some keys to make sure that Jesus pulls up, I think are in the text compelling us First and foremost, to find your two or three. So that's the first thing I want you to write down, take a mental note. Jesus, pull up. How? I got to first find my two or three. Scripture says, listen, if two of you agree about anything on earth, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Another verse right here in this passage says, if two of you agree on anything, you ask, it will be done. Some of us need to appreciate that finding your two or three is an important conceptual framework and an important practice to commit to. That we must find a few folk out of the many that we can live in community with to help us deal with those struggles we have and wade through those troublesome waters. Everybody say, find your two or three. Say that, find your two or three. Now, what I appreciate about 
this point, particularly I read some of the old patristics, you know, these are the early church fathers and mothers from the first, second, third, and fourth century. Uh, most of them wrote in other languages, so I'm reading the translations of their, their, their work in an origin of Alexandria, which is in Egypt. Uh, some of his earliest commentary on this passage was so phenomenal because he reminded me that unity does not mean uniformity. So finding your two or three in order for Jesus to pull up does not require us to be uniform, meaning to be identical, to agree on everything. Origen says that there are two words to live in concord or in togetherness. There is the agreement of thought when minds think the same ideas and have the same thoughts. So we all have kind of, you know, the same ideas and the same thoughts. And then there is the concord of the will, where we agree that we will live, listen to this, similar lives. I, I was arrested by, 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 by Origen's analysis about what this passage is saying. He is saying that if I find my two or three and we are living in concord with one another, it does not mean that we have to agree on everything. Nor does it mean that we have to necessarily be identical, but he says that it is the agreement that we will have the same ideas and put those in conversations with living similar lives. He goes on to say then, at least this is how I'm extrapolating it for today, that unity is not uniformity. The best commitment towards unity is harmony. That harmony is how we live well with one another when we don't agree on the same issue. Amen. Harmony. <laughs> now, there are some of us who are gifted in singing or playing. And all of us, when you're in a musical, how many of you go to the symphonies and stuff like that? L later today, I'm going to the San Francisco Opera in the park. Yes, it's, 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 it's a very fascinating development. I'll <laughs> preach about that another day. <laughs> but music is a fascinating practice because there are moments in every musical compilation where difference will be brought into harmony. And it is beautiful, right? Harmony is not that we all think the same way. It is really that we are agreeing that our similar lives, because, you know, being at the opera is very different than being at the way. They're similar, but they're different <laughs> in many ways, right? But there is a commitment in the gathering that is similar that people are meeting with some intentionality around and for a particular purpose. And so what I want to submit to you is finding the two or three is literally about us committing not to all having the same thoughts or perhaps even living the identically same way. It's about us saying, I with my differences am willing to live in harmony with people who I may not agree with on everything. Now, this is what the church, I believe, in America needs to figure out a way to work out much more than it has in the past, particularly because we in American churches have become so ideological and so defined by our theological differences. I mean, that is really what the Protestant Reformation, I can't, I'm, I'm gonna have to talk to the ministers, deacons, and and the TLC members about this, and maybe we'll do an after church study on this one day. But the Protestant Reformation in 1517 was literally about people balkanizing themselves because they did not agree on everything. And sometimes our disagreements may feel like we can't cross the bridge together, but there are more things that we have in common than it is we have in difference. And yet, I often tell my evangelical friends, 
my holiness friends, my Catholic friends, my Buddhist, my Muslim friends, all my friends who claim some kind of faith that our ideological and doctrinal purity is not necessary for our unity. Like I grew up in the apostolic holiness Pentecostal church. I'm a fourth generation, which means, you know, all kinds of things. Speak in tongues, roll on the floor, swing from the chandelier, and on a good Sunday, we levitate. Somebody say amen. <laughs> But in my and our kind of tradition in the earliest days, it was assumed that not everybody who said they were Christian was going to make it to heaven. Which just meant that, man, you can be a Christian in some people's sensibility and won't even qualify to make it in. Obviously, that was not true. It can't be true or else big old heaven would be a really waste of space. We had to appreciate, or I had to appreciate, or I have come to learn this, this truth, that what we believe, listen to this, because this is a huge part of what I'm trying to communicate today. What we believe should be the soil that produces ethical application of treatment of others as a noble outcome or goal of our said commitments. Which is just to say, I may not agree with you ideologically, doctrinally, theologically, but what I do believe ought to produce an ethical practice in the public space that treats you and your family and your community well, even if we don't always agree. So if I believe that Jesus is Lord, that means that I ought to be in the public square being able to treat everybody well. Because I believe Jesus is Lord. Not get in a public square and be like, well, because you don't believe Jesus is Lord. <laughs> and we, we, we about to have a fight. No, Jesus ain't asking you to be fighting with nobody like that. You know, the only time Jesus seemed to get upset is when people was being exploited by the powers. Jesus said, oh, we got to shut this thing down. Jesus didn't get upset with them because they didn't believe. <laughs> Jesus often found a way to pull people who did not believe closer to him through his acts of kindness, mercy, supernatural miracles. Wouldn't it be something if you and I cultivated spaces where we did not agree, where Jesus can pull up and do a miracle? Woo. Where we don't agree, pull up and feed some folk. Where we don't agree, pull up and heal some folk. Where we don't agree, actually just pull up Jesus and do anything, praise God. Cause, cause, cause I'm, I'm, I'm tired of the division around where we don't agree. Ethical application is more important than you harboring on, let me say not more, be precise in my language, I've been critiqued. Ethical application is just as important that's what you believe. Because if your belief cannot produce good life-giving behavior to your neighbor, I want to know, do you really believe what you believe? Mm -hmm. So the first question I have, do you have your two or three people that can trigger the Jesus pull-up effect? <laughs> have you found your two or three people? Now, you got to be, be, be mindful. You know, some of us have our two or three people that produce the opposite of the Jesus pull-up effect. Yeah. I got my two or three people that I know if we together, Jesus is not going to, you know, be pulling up. <laughs> we going <laughs> to roll up some sleeves. And we, we, about to, we about to, you know, we about to get down in a way that I'm going to have to ask for forgiveness later. Anybody got those two or three people in your life? Hey Amen. I thank you for the honest folk in the building. But you better have you your two or three pull up Jesus folk. They can trigger. They can activate Jesus wherever you are. You could be in a disagreeable space. Yesterday I showed up at this, this uh, public safety meeting. And there was a lot of foolishness going on at that meeting. But I was grateful to look around and I saw a few pull-up effect, folks. Jesus, pull up. I said, mm, I'm glad you're here, because I'm about to be animated up in here, but I believe 
that since you here and not the other folk, then I'm gonna still leave out of here with my witness intact. Somebody say amen. How can you create an environment of belonging and inclusion where more people are excited to join our community? And you, child of God, must appreciate that there are lots of people who are looking for community, but they don't want the exclusion, the condemnation, the hypocrisy. They want community without all the, the assumptions and the pretense that too often is invisible to the person throwing all that out. You and I must have a theological, doctrinal, ideological, political, uh, cultural kind of, 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 of soil that is producing healing, bridging. You can believe what you can believe, but the cool thing about belief, that is, listen to this, the cool thing about belief that is bigger than you is that you will change over time. <laughs> I preached last, was it last week? Did I preach here last week? Okay, it's the week before. The week before I preached at uh, uh, my home church, by the way, and I preached a, one of my favorite passages of scripture, Philippians chapter 1, 6, it says, I am confident of this very thing, that the one who started good work in you will perform it or bring it to the day of completion by the day of Jesus Christ. And the first four or five words, I am confident of this very thing, in the original language, the word for confidence is persuasion. That is to say that in the the, the mind of Paul who wrote this, Paul is saying, your confidence comes from you being persuaded over and over again over time of this idea that God is always working on you until you get to your final day. Faith ought to always be transforming you over time. There are things I have grown to believe because God kept working on me. I didn't have the faith to believe some things early on in my Christian faith, but I still had faith. But over time, God began to convince me over and over and over again that God could do anything but fail. Over time, God began to convince me over and over again that the people I thought God would not save, God saved. Over time, God began to convince me over and over again that the things God didn't care about, God cared about. And so over time, my faith, though it fit snug like a, a little, you know, tailored suit, had to become big like an old school choir robe. Where there's a lot of room for God to grow me. And you ought to be that kind of person. That Lord, I'm finding my two or three people. Why? Because I need to be stretched. So I can have more room for Jesus to pull up. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him I need Jesus to pull up. Will you pull up with me? So Jesus can't pull up. And, and, then, and then what I love about verse number 18. The scripture says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Intentionality and agreements. Jesus is telling his disciples, listen, I'm giving you some authority. I'm giving you not authority in the sense like you the law. You know, like you can, you know, like jack somebody. <laughs> you can accost somebody. Because I mean, some people use their authority in that way. Oh, I, you know, you know, I remember in, uh, what was that, what was that in uh, Thin Line Between Love and Hate? And, 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 and Martin was talking about, you know, flashlight cop, I see you. <laughs> you have met, <laughs> you have met somebody who got a little bit of authority and their chest puff out. <laughs> why are you here? Man, what do you mean, why am I here? It's a free country. I'm a free man. If you touch me, I'm a free black man. I go wherever I want to go. You regulating my movements through the world? You don't even got a gun. I'm just like, <laughs> Lord, help me to preach and not be up here. <laughs> I'm just trying to, just trying to. We have authority, but not the kind of authority 
to lord over people. It is authority like you have the opportunity, listen, to use and assume you have power. Power to not be a victim, but to have intentionality. Intentionality is a very important thing in our lives because sometimes you can do things on accident or you can do things on purpose. How many have ever stumbled into a blessing? He's like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Man, I, I, I got, Lord, I thank you. But how many have ever done something over time with intention and you arrived at your blessing? I love the stumbling and the blessings, but there's something about doing something over time with intentionality and I arrive. I look back on my life, on my shoulder, like, look, 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 look what God did. This, this had to, Jesus take the wheel. That's what, you know, it's just like, you know, I know God that if I do my part, you gonna do yours. Well, Jesus, in the context of what do you do when you have a problem with someone, Jesus is also giving to his disciples the authority to help ensure people understand that when conflicts arise, I expect community to help resolve those conflicts. So if there's a problem on earth, Jesus says, if you guys can figure it out, then I will listen, rubber stamp your conclusion. Jesus said, I'm giving you divine affirmation to work out differences in community. And we can then expand that in all kinds of ways. Because if it's true that with intentionality, our agreements, going back to this, uh, this sense of concord and harmony, that when we agree with our thoughts that intersect with our will, we can produce harmony through intentionality. I want you to know, child of God, the only way you get to harmony is through intentionality. You don't stumble into harmony. Have you ever been a part of a you know, music group? You don't stumble into good parts. Have you ever been a musician? You don't stumble into staying in a pocket. <laughs> Amen. If you ever been on a team, you don't stumble into good production. It takes intentionality. And the intentionality must be grounded in agreement. Now listen, this is the hardest part because we may not always agree, but remind yourself that the things we agree on are enough with intentionality to produce harmony. Now, that's not even on my paper. I just felt the Holy Ghost just, just help me make sense of all this stuff. Don't ask me to say it again because I don't even know what I said. Just watch it on the replay. But I believe what I said now. <laughs> that when we have intentionality that is literally fueled by our agreements, it leads us into places of harmony. And I want you and I to be people who appreciate that when we do that, Jesus pulls up. Jesus is the secret sauce to our harmony. Now, I want you to understand that when I say Jesus pulling up and Jesus is the secret sauce, I'm literally talking about the activity, the spiritual activity. I want to remind you, beloved, that, that uh, uh, there's work that you can do that does not have Jesus attached to it, that is still good work. But there is the same work you could do than when you add the activity of the divine. The secret sauce. You could be serving someone some food and it will bless their belly. But with the secret sauce of the divine, you can bless their belly and their soul. You can be working on a job and getting your check but with a little bit of divine secret sauce. You can actually change the heart and the mind of your coworker who may be on the verge of losing it all. But because you got a little Jesus sauce, Lord, help me to preach in here today. We, we, we got some pretty mundane kind of kind of activities we launching. We launching a men's fellowship. Hey, hanging out with, with uh, Brother Kariga on Sundays and Mr. Fab at the Thug Therapy on Wednesdays. 
mundane things. I can show up there and I will and I do. But with a little extra Jesus sauce, some divine sauce, a little meeting of some men can actually turn into a revival. We got a book club and the book clubs are nice. They help you to learn words and, 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 and extract new thoughts with a little bit of extra divine sauce. A book club can turn into something that animates your soul and, and causes you to recover life in dead places. We got a brown bag ministry feeding those who are less fortunate. That is noble work. But with a little bit of extra Jesus divine sauce, you can do something more than quell the hunger pains of a beloved one. We got a hiking group. And aside from losing some weight and looking at the beauty of creation, which is all necessary and good, you can literally walk in the path and introduce some Jesus sauce. And all of a sudden, the confessions and the fellowship can turn into tears and healing running down somebody's face. I'm talking about intentionality. I'm talking about some agreements. Uh, and that's why I love this last point uh, that says where two or three are gathered in my name. He says, I am there among them. Uh, I want you to know you need to look for Jesus uh, whenever you get into a room with two or three other people uh, that have gathered in his name. Uh, understand, beloved, that when you gather in Jesus' name, uh, you're doing a few things. The first thing, gathering means there's a location. It means that we are gathering. Somebody say we. When, when, you, when you say two or three, it means that there's more than one of you there. That means that we are gathering, but we're also building community. And when you have a location and there's community, you're agreeing that we're going to meet up. And guess what? In Jesus' name, mean, and I'm bringing Jesus right along with me. Uh-huh. The eye that has Jesus along with me everywhere I go is now going to come in a room with some other eyes who have Jesus with them wherever they go. And how many of you know that's why we say that the Jesus in me loves the Jesus in you and it's so easy Lord, I feel a little preach coming on. It's so easy to love. And if my Jesus inside of me can get a hold to your Jesus inside of you, then I believe we got the pull of Jesus effect that when Jesus pulls up, devil's got to flee. When Jesus pulls up, bodies have to be healed. When Jesus Jesus pulls up, injustice got to take a step back. When Jesus pulls up, all of your pet peeves got to go to the background. When Jesus pulls up, I got to learn to love you deeper. When Jesus pulls up, I got to figure out how to let this go, how to forgive you, how to move forward. Because Jesus, he's the ultimate pull up effect. He walks with me. He talks with me. He reminds me that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Ain't no devil can stop God's two or three. When Jesus pulls up, somebody shout hallelujah. So your task today is to go throughout the week, show up on your job and say, Jesus, pull up. Find your two or three at your school and say, Jesus, pull up. Find your other person in your home and say, Jesus, pull up. I need you today. I need you right now. Pull up. Somebody shout hallelujah. Jesus pulling up guarantees that your ordinary gathering turns into a supernatural encounter. 
I don't know, y'all. Maybe you don't need a supernatural encounter like I need one. But when I'm wrestling with that devil, I need Jesus to pull up. Pull on up, Jesus. I need you to pull up or it's gonna go sideways. <laughs> Come on, stand with me, everybody. Let's take a moment to ask God to pull up. Because when we get together and Jesus is there, Sometimes it's about us training our eyes to see Jesus among us. I love one of the mystics, can't remember exactly who it is, that says there is a spark of the divine in all of us. There's a spark of the divine in all of us. There's a piece of God in everybody you meet. Even if you don't always exist in alignment, there's something in people God has permanently stamped. So we who know that all of us come from the same source, we can be on the lookout for God and other people. If nothing more, child of God, we ought to always be able to find God in other people. <laughs> it can be hard because other people, they be full of the devil, praise God. There's some folk, they just so full of the devil, you just be like, God, you must, there's an exception to every one of your rules. <laughs> and that very well may be true. There's an exception. Jesus had 12 disciples and one of them was a what? Backstabbing, demon-filled betraying devil so that ratio listen to this means that one out of every 12 people you meet may may be problematic but if you can't get along with nobody you can't you can't find God in nobody your ratio is off it's off it's just off which just means that sometimes Jesus pulling up is also for me inside the we. How many want Jesus to pull up? God, I need you to pull up. I, I, I really do, God. And then, you know, I know we laugh a little bit. I try to, you know, keep us a little light because some of this stuff can be real heavy. Some of us care a lot. But I want you to be clear. We need Jesus to pull up. We need you to pull up in our relationships, in our homes, in our schools. In the, we need you to pull up whether we at the game, whether we in the club, whether we at the opera in the park, whether we at the museum. Jesus, I just need you to pull wherever I'm at. I need you to pull up. And that just means that I got to live in community with other people to guarantee you pull up. I can't be walking through life by myself waiting for you to pull up and get the same miraculous impact that you guarantee happens when I'm in community with one another. God's not asking you to be friends with everybody. God's saying, find you two or three people. If you can't find two or three people, then we got to have you come to the prayer meeting on Tuesday nights. <laughs> and I'm telling you, this prayer minister and woman will just... Everything that's in you that's causing you to not to have two or three people, it'll just come out. It'll just be like, but guess what? That's happening in community. That's your two. That's your number two right there. Give me a high five. I need a number two in my life. Come on, grab the hand of someone or touch their shoulder or just make a connection. I know some of us are worried about COVID a little bit, so we don't want to be too, you know, whatever. But just, you know, just just reach out and, and, and just ask, ask God to bless your neighbor. Ask God to give your neighbor what they need to live in community, in harmony with God, with others, and with themselves. God, I pray for the person who I'm touching. I pray that you will bring them into a place, God, that allows us to see the you in them, the God in them. Lord, I pray that whatever they're dealing with, God, today, it will miraculously be interrupted by the power of your spirit if they need salvation today i pray salvation would find them if they need power i pray power will find them if they need help if they need healing i pray god that 
they will live this week, this month, the rest of this year with intentionality. That harmony will find them where they agree. And that, that agreement and intentionality will produce the conditions for miracles, signs, and wonders. Because we need them today, God. In a world that is literally breaking apart, we want to come together around that which we can't agree on. And even when we can't agree, God, I pray that harmony, respect, tenderness will remain in our interactions one with another. So I pray for my beloved who I'm touching, who I'm in agreement with. I take intention to intercede on their behalf. And I ask you, Lord, have your way. Have your way. Break the yoke in their life. Loose the chains. And God, do it in the name of Jesus. Not if your hands where you're standing. It's me, oh Lord, inside the we, and I'm standing in the need of prayer. It's not my mother, it's not my father, it's not my sister or my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. I need to be saved. I need to be healed. I need to be delivered. I need to be made new. I need you in so many different ways that God, if you just pull up, I'm sure whatever you pull up and find, you will start working in an indescribable way. And so I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you will bless you will heal and you will deliver bless my family my marriage my partnerships bless my children bless my business bless the transitions happening in my relationships lord whether it's divorce or separation or or mutual lord god co-parenting whether it's god trying to figure out how to make my relationships on my job or in my vocation the conflicts i'm in with people in the community god the the, the wicked conflicts in this country god help me to be an agent that can create the conditions for you to pull up. Because I trust your word more than I, Lord God, am fearful of the circumstances of my situation. I know you can do anything but fail. So work on this situation. Work on me, Lord. Work on us, Lord. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them, pull up, Jesus. Give him a high five and tell him, I need Jesus to pull up. I need Jesus to pull up. Find somebody else. Tell him, I need Jesus to pull up. Jesus is going to pull up in your situation this week. Give God one more hand. Praise him.